We're not quite ready yet, so there's not many people here that have been to one of our seminars before, so I'm going to tell my story one last time, just to kind of warm you up before we get going, because there's still a few people trickling in. I'm sure I've never heard this. Yeah, I'm sure you haven't either. <laughs> so um, I've been in this industry a long time, and, and my wife and I liked to camp, and then we had these two kids, so she decided she wanted an RV, so we bought a tent trailer. And uh, up on the Columbia River, uh, nah, not too far from Hood River, west of Hood River, is a little state campground, Oregon side, Viento Park, really a cool little park. And uh, we were on the outskirts near the trains, and uh, there's a nice paved walkway to the restrooms. So that night, uh, my daughter and my wife needed to go to the restroom, and it's lit way down by the bathroom, but not out where we are. So they went down, walked down there, and anyways, came back, and no problem. Next morning, they got up, went to the potty again, came back, my wife was just white as a ghost. And uh, I said, what's the matter? She said, well, last night, we had to walk around this big rock, but there wasn't a rock there this morning. So that was, uh, it was a bear. So that was the end of the tent trailer, and, and we moved from that. Yeah, I need a new story, don't I? That's the best story I've ever heard. No, that was good. That was good. That's the best story I've ever heard 37 times. Yeah, well, at least. We started putting cougar in it. You know? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we can get him to tell a Sasquatch story, so uh, <laughs> not too often. I've seen him. <laughs> So uh, looks like we could use a few more chairs again, I think. We got some on the side of Oh, okay. Well, it's time, so good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Welcome to Guarantee's uh, Winterization Seminar. My name is Dan. I'm the weekend guy. This is Dave Taylor. He is the number one service manager. He runs the big building up at First Street. I have I get paid to do this. He does this for free because he's it. just the man. So um, hey Jake, I'd like to welcome everybody. We do this I need a couple. out of the kindness of my boss's heart. <laughs> we do this to inform you. Together, I've got like 38, 39 years, and he's got like 35 years. So we've been in this industry for a long time, and the whole point of these seminars is to share with you our experience and our knowledge. We're not okay. here to try and sell you anything. We're here to give you our knowledge and advice if you seek it. Um, we are question driven, so if you have questions, stick your hand up, yell, because I'm deaf, shot too many guns when I was younger. So, build it out there. And, is that me? That's him. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, we're going get, to get started here. Uh, how many of you folks have tent trailers? Ooh, good. Yeah, nobody. Um, pickup campers. One way back there. I got one, but it's in back there. <laughs> no, that doesn't count. Okay, he's got a big diesel pusher. Who else, who else has fifth wheels? So we're all motorized for the most part, right? No? I'm sorry, trailer? Travel trailer. Okay, a couple travel trailers and travel trailer. Okay, so there's, the, the reason we ask this is to know what kind of questions to, way to, way to steer it. There's going to be a few of you that have aqua hots. Who has the hydronic heating? No hydronic heating. That's going to be great. Yeah, he, 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 hardest, he doesn't count. That's the hardest one to yeah. try to show you how to winterize. So we're not going to bother with hydronic heating. Hydronic heating is um, it's basically a, a boiler in your compartment. It takes uh, water, heats it through a diesel burner, and then you use it for hot water as well as your heat. Block heater, uh, a lot of Highline motorhomes have them. They were aqua hots with the Wabasso burner. Now they're hydro hots. There's four or five names out there now. But in order to winterize, that's a very expensive boiler. In order to winterize it, usually we have to do a whole system flush rather than blow it out with air, which is what we're going to go over today. 
We're going to go over both today, a whole system flush and blowing it out with air. Who won? I did because they you, put more you chairs did, in. You did. We were you looking always to see win. who had more people on their side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He always wins. So anyway, uh, before we get into it, uh, being as he's the service manager hands-on and he knows this stuff, he's going to do most of the talking on the winterization. In his contract, though, he gets to talk about poop in every seminar, and he just loves doing it. So at some point, he's going to... Uh... Where's my stick? <laughs> so anyway, before we get going with his stuff, I just have a couple little thoughts I'd like to present. When we're doing winterizing, that's pretty much the end of it for everybody. Uh, you're done camping for the, a couple, three months while it's pretty cold out. And I want to talk about, well, he's going to talk about winterizing and the plumbing system. I want to talk about your battery. That's what I like to talk about. Your batteries, if, if they are fully charged, they are lead plate and sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid freezes at like minus 85 degrees. Colder than we're going to see it anywhere in Oregon. If you have a discharged there's a couple chairs up here, sir. There's one up here. One here. We're one big happy family. Yeah. We don't bite. Very hard. He, he tolerated me yesterday. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, if, you're, if we're talking about your batteries, if your coach or chassis batteries are discharged, what you have is, is lead sulfate in solution and water. And so my moral of my story is if you have a discharged battery, it is very susceptible to freezing. So while you're preparing your coach for the winter, you need to make sure that your batteries are fully charged. And if, if they're, you don't have to remove them from the coach if they're fully charged, they'll winter just fine but we would recommend you unhooking the ground cable. That way they can't discharge. Or if you have a disconnect, you make sure that the disconnect is switched and uh, that your batteries are in good shape. If you want to remove your batteries, you can go and put them in uh, the, the garage or whatever. There's an old wives' tale when the old rubber casing batteries were what we used. If you sat them on concrete, the moisture in a concrete would tend to discharge uh, the batteries. With the plastic case batteries, we don't have that issue. You don't need to put them on plywood you just, or wood. You just set them on the floor. As long as they're fully charged or fairly charged, they'll be just fine, even in a cold garage. Three months, even though you think you're going to remember how you unhooked them, you won't. Yes. Yeah, and they don't idea. use red and black anymore on everything. Sometimes it's black and white, red and white, red and black. You know, just take a picture. So I have a solar panel that trickle charges my battery. Is that good over the winter? Or? Are you parking it outside or inside? Outside. outside. Are you going to cover it? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's my next little conversation. Um, the, his, his question was, is, I have a solar panel. Is that okay? Is that going to help? Yeah, that, that, if, as long as two things, it's not covered and it's, the solar panel is cleaned, the maintenance on solar panels, you need to clean them once or twice a year with mild soap and water, get all of the pollution, the dirt, and everything off of them, and then they're fine. They will, they will maintain the battery even in a cold, nasty day like today, you know, welcome to the Northwest. This, the solar panels will do just fine. If, if your coach is wired right, his question is, do you unhook all the grounds or just what? If your coach is wired right, you have a primary ground and everything comes to that one post and then from that post down, that's the only negative that you need to worry about. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, 
covers. <laughs> there, if you can't afford a barn or a, a metal cover, these actually work okay. They're a pain in the neck, but they do pretty good. Uh, I've got a little cargo slash, I think it's called a work and play. Yeah, it's, it's a little one. It's 21 feet long. And I don't use it hardly ever. I bought it to remodel a couple of houses. And I've had a cover on it for like four years. And as long as you, they, they come with uh, corset ties and they don't show you this, but if you, if you get the right one and it's nice and snug, they last for a long time. And, and you, around here we use the aqua shed, which will actually breathe. And so even if you put your coach away wet, couple weeks later you go in and undo the zipper and open it up and you look you know go inside the outside of the coach is nice and dry because the moisture evaporates and it it, it actually perspires out of the pores in the covers there we recommend them so those and I apologize for picking on you but uh, it's we just right there <laughs> Anyway, those are the two thoughts that I have. Are you ready to jump into it? Yeah, I love this thing. Okay, this is my favorite seminar and probably the shortest seminar and the hardest one because everybody has a little bit something different. Uh, we're going to pretend, I'm going to do the, the, the basic winterize first is what we do with the thousand rigs we own here. Matter of fact, I have about six technicians right now working eight hours a day for the next two to three weeks doing nothing all day long but driving around in winterizing vehicles doing winterizes. They're going to be okay for about the next week or two it looks like weather wise but they are going to have some bad days out there. So we're all going to pretend even though if you have a motor home the basic structure of it's going to be just like a 28 foot fifth wheel or trailer. You're going to have a fresh tank I, I did not not do good in uh, art class, so bear with me. You're going to have a water pump over here somewhere. This fresh tank is going to come out the bottom and go to a water pump. From that water pump, it's going to go over here, go up to your faucets. It's going to go to your toilet. It's going to go to your outside shower, your ice maker, your washer dryer, anything you have in there that uses water, that water is going to go and pressurize that system. You're also going to have, besides the pump to pressurize your system, is your city water hookup. So somewhere on the side of your unit, you're going to have this spot where your garden hose hooks in. Now this city water hookup always comes in on this side right in this line they put a T. Reason for that is that's the same line your pump would pressurize so when your city water pressurizes it basically you just don't run your pump pressurizes the system. If at any time you're camping somewhere and you're there for two or three days usually when I camp I take extra water <coughs> excuse me I fill this tank just because I camp, we're going camping this next weekend. We camp places where sometimes power goes out uh, in these campgrounds, or runoff well, which is on power. So just in case, I make sure I have water. If you wake up in the morning and you're hooked to city water, this tank also has, if you don't have a valve to city fill your fresh tank, has what they call a side fill or a country fill, which is where you stick the hose in the side of your trailer or motor home and it fills through a hose into your fresh tank. If you wake up and water is dripping out of this, and it shouldn't be, the only thing that keeps this city water from coming back into this tank are the valves in this pump. So you start getting water dripping back through, filling your tank up, it'll come out this fill hole. We see it quite often. Usually you can just run your pump for five or ten minutes. What causes it most of the time is a little piece of sand or sediment gets in these three valves. A pump has, a pump basically looks like a heart inside when you tear it apart. It's got these three circular valves and they all pump in a rotation. 
which pressurizes the system. You get a little piece of sand in there, water can come the wrong way through your pump. More information than you probably need for winterizing. Just trying to, if that happens, don't panic, run your pump a little bit. If it continues, then one of these has got a split in it. And it can happen on a new unit, used unit. It can happen two days after you put it in, or it can last 20 years. They're man-made, just happens. Okay, so saying this, everybody kind of knows water gets pressurized up. So winterizing. This is the hard part. Again, we're on a 28-foot trailer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a standard winterize. And then if you have questions or I miss something on your trailer, we'll, here in a little bit, we'll go over it. The first thing you got to do, the main reason is to get water out of the system. The water itself expands. A lot of, we get people that say, oh, I winterized it. I went underneath my trailer. Let's make a trailer here. And this has a drain with either, either a, a little turn valve or a cap on it. And then somewhere in the system here, you're going to have what they call low points. If you can't read that, just go like that. It'll all come into focus. And it's going to be the same way, a valve or caps. Now, one low point is for your cold water. This one is going to be, one of them is going to be your hot water. Because that hot, or that cold water, of course, supplies the hot side of your unit. In and out. So somewhere you're going to have low points. So the first thing you're going to do is go out, take these caps off. Hopefully the night before especially on the tank drain because usually you have 40 to 100 gallons of fresh water and you're going to go out and be all ready to do this and that's when you're going to realize that they plumbed it with a half inch drain so you're going to pull the cap off everything and about six hours later your tank will be dry so do it the night before you got something to when it, when it comes time yeah he's he's big on these blowout tools we're going to show you this one, and then we're going to show you, tell you the right way to do it if you're going to winterize every year. So, first thing you've done is drain this. Open your low points. You're going to go inside your unit. You're going to open hot and cold on the sink, bathroom sink, kitchen sink, shower. You're going to go outside. If you have one of those outside showers where you flip the door down and you can pull it out and wash your feet or the dog, open those. Make sure the head's on, or on so the water will blow out. We'll go over ice makers and stuff in a little bit, because that gets a little more complicated. So you have everything open. That's when you're going to go to your water heater. Most of what, this is a manual water heater, but uh, basically your water heater is going to look like this once you take the styrofoam off. So it could be bigger. It could be porcelain inside. This one isn't. So, most units have what they call a hot water heater, or excuse me, a water heater bypass. If somebody says it's not a hot water heater, tell them that's not, in fact, true. Because this will start to reheat that water before it gets cold, so it actually is reheating hot water. There's always that guy at every campground. Don't call it a hot water heater. You can't heat hot water. Yes, you can. So, most of them have a T-valve just like this. Real easy to turn. In standard operating, when you're using it, your bypass is going to be closed. This is basically the direction of the water flow. Your hot and cold would be open. So in turn, your cold's coming in, heating, coming out is hot. This stops between the two from commingling. So you're going to go inside. You're going to bypass by opening this one, which in turn lets the cold water go directly into the hot, and you're going to shut off your hot water heater. Then you're going to go outside. You're going to stand back a little bit, 
you're going to take this little pressure valve and lift up on it, and it's going to go psh. That's why you stand off to the side. If not, you're going to be wet. Then you're going to take this plug out. There's a plug right here in the bottom. Thanks. That's hard to lift with one hand. Some are plastic, some are steel. So you take that plug out. If it's steel, more than likely it's going to have an anode rod. It's a zinc rod designed to catch calcium and irons and deposits and all sorts of stuff running through the water that's going to ruin your aluminum tank. Aluminum fishing boats usually have zinc plates somewhere on the boat to uh, stop electrolysis on the boat. So that's the same thing this does. You pull this out, you lay it here in the bottom, pull your plug out. So then you've basically taken this away from the system. The water is going to come out the bottom real slow. You don't have to worry about winterizing that anymore. There's going to be water in the bottom. However, it's the expansion of water that does the damage. So if you only have this much in the bottom, it's not going to grow enough to damage this tank. We've actually seen these expand big enough where we've had to take cabinets out and get in with sawzalls and cut them out in chunks because when they when they expand and rupture, it's just like a balloon. It'll grow four, five, six inches before it finally tears. And that's the biggest hole we got to take it out of right there is the side of your motorhome or your fifth wheel or trailer. So we have to get in and cut it down small enough to get it out of that hole. Okay, so now what you're left with is an RV with everything open. This is bypassed. If you don't have a bypass, you don't have to do this. I'll explain that later. You can buy an aftermarket bypass and have it installed. They sell them. Great to have. So then you're going to get a blowout tool. Let, let, me, let me go back just a sec. Let me have those two. Great time to rinse out your water heater. Great little cheap tool. Probably not your first year, but your second year of use, where you took that plug out, you're going to hook this to your garden hose, you're going to stick it in there, turn it on, stand back, wash the inside of your tank out. You'll be surprised what comes out of there, even if you have water filters. So clean it out, great time. If you get to where you start smelling your hot water, it smells like grandma's shower used to when you were a kid out in the farm, a little sulfury, it's usually because your hot water heater's dirty inside. So rinse it out. So now you're going to get a blowout tool is what they call it. Put that over here. There's different ones. There's ones you can hook directly onto your air hose. There's some that have like a little, uh, looks like a tie, the end of a tire. So you can use your tire chuck to blow through it. This one's a new one for me. Okay. So, you're going to get one of these. If you're going to do this every year, what every technician here does is they go down here to Jerry's and they get a three-quarter inch, three-quarter inch brass valve with a shutoff. And then they adapt it down. Like I say, I didn't pass art class. So, so that it has an air hook up on it. So you can hook your air compressor to it. What the valve does is let you turn the air on or off or regulate the pressure. This is, as soon as you hook it up, you're wide open. I don't like to do anything wide open. The newer motorhomes and stuff, if you have all everything open, you're never going to blow enough air through it to hurt anything. But if you're out there blowing through it and the grandkid thinks, hey, what's all this noise in here? And he goes around and starts shutting off all the faucets, thinking he's being a good boy because grandpa left the, all the faucets open. As soon as he restricts enough air, you can't start blowing up water lines. So, and then what you do is on this, this valve actually is off the side here. Up top here is your hose where you screw it into the side of your trailer where you'd hook up city water. So then what you do is you screw this in the side, close the valve, Hook your air to it. Run around one more time. 
Make sure your low points are open, tank drains, everything is going to get air blown through it. And you're going to turn the air on real slow. And you'll hear it, usually coming out the low points first. Okay, everybody with me so far? Now, what this air is going to do is go to the passively, path of least resistance, which is going to be your low points. Let them blow out a little bit. Turn off your air, go back under, and cap off your low points. So that's going to force any air to go out the faucets, showers, whatever you got up top. Turn the air back on. Let it run about 10 minutes. You're going to go inside. This is where I get to mention poop. It's a poop stick. You're going to build one. This one hasn't been used or I would be holding it at this end. You're going to make a stick out of something and you're going to make sure this stick is wider at the top than the opening in your toilet. I've seen technicians go in and stick cans of spray paint in there and it works great. And then they go in and they just bump that toilet valve and the next thing you know we're trying to fish a, a can of spray paint out of a toilet. If it's a fifth wheel the tank's got to come out. So and usually they do that on their day off. <laughs> Uh huh. So you make you a poop stick. Usually we drill a hole through it and it hangs on the side of our toolbox. So you're going to go in and you're going to open the foot feet on your toilet and drop this down in the hole and walk away. That's going to let the air blow the water through that toilet valve. Because we hear people say, no, I've drained it all. And we ask them, did you blow out everything? Well, no, I just drained everything and opened all the valves. That water is still stuck inside that valve. And when that water expands, you wouldn't believe how many people we get in here. I bet you we play, replace 150 faucets or toilet valves in the first two weeks of next spring. <coughs> because that doesn't do it. You have to get the water out. Don't be afraid to let your compressor run for 10-15 minutes. That air not only pushes the water out, it dries the lines. So if you have a low spot in the line, and moisture, even after you quit blowing, goes there. It's not going to rupture the line because it will have enough room to go both directions. You should be fine. The main thing is all the hardware. Faucets, outside shower, shower heads. Big one. Now, speaking of shower heads, some of us have where you turn on the shower down here at the bottom of your shower and then it has this hose that comes up and hangs off the side with your shower head on it so you can pull it off and wash and do all that after you're done winterizing you're going to unscrew it from here and just let it hang down in the tub because what will happen is if it doesn't blow it all up and out of this hose what it can do is back up into the neck and split the neck so that, that's your main thing. Try to get every bit of water out as you can. Now, when you're done, the last couple seconds, you're going to take that low point drain caps off again. And you're going to get another little spurt. Because whatever was in there made its way into that little hose. You're going to leave all this open all year long. You can put the cap on if you're worried about something crawling up in there, a spider or something, but don't tighten it. You want the air to be able to circulate, let any little last little dribble come out. I've heard stories that wasps get in there. If the wasps get in there, you didn't dewinterize soon enough. I mean, if you're waiting to July for your first trip, yeah, wasps can find a water tank to be really nice because they're nice and toasty warm and clean and... So, now ice makers, if you have an ice maker, I have to tell you good luck. Because an ice maker is going to have valves. A, a valve. If you have an ice maker with ice water feature in the door, then you're going to have two valves. You're going to have a valve for the ice maker and you're going to have a valve for uh, the on demand water filter in your refrigerator. 
you're going to have a little quarter inch water hose that goes up to this round magnetic valve on the back of your refrigerator. I'm just burning through paper today. I love it. We got that free. It's okay. So, oh, good. What's going to happen is there's two, there's 110 volt, this magnetic valve, when your ice maker up here in your fridge or your freezer says, hey, give me some ice or give me some water, it's going to signal the control board, which is 12 volts. This timer is going to go off. This 12 volts is going to trigger a relay telling this 110 volts, that's the 110 volts that hurts you when it gets you. It's going to tell to open this magnetic valve, which is going to let water go up the back and fill your ice maker for a certain amount of seconds. And usually they have adjustments. If your ice cubes are too big, we can make them smaller. If they're not big enough, we'll make them bigger. The trick is, when you're blowing air through this, how can you get that valve to open to get that water that's between here and here out of that hose? There's a trick. I'll tell you how I do mine. I'm not suggesting you do it. This, this little ice maker line that comes in to supply this, it just has a little screw. Unscrew it, let it hang down. While you're blowing, the water will come right out. It's this water here that does the damage. So, these two wires that plug in, or again, 110 volts. I've made this thing that they call uh, a widow maker or a hot shot. It's just suicide cord. suicide cord. I'm not saying that you do this, but the only way to get that water out of there is to take an old extension cord you had and you put butt connectors on the end so there's no live wires. They're spade connectors is what we call them, butt connectors, spade connectors, because you're gonna have two flat, connectors like that coming out of this valve. So then you can run, while you're blowing air out, you can run your extension cord out, plug in this thing, unplug the two wires that are on there, the black and the white, and hook your wires to it, which then tells this valve, oh, the timer has gone off and told me to open up. That will then force air through the whole system, shoot it out into your ice maker bucket, and you're water free. If you don't feel like doing that, fortunately we don't, we don't get a lot of this broke. We do get a lot of these broke. Um, you know, you might be able to put a little insulation around it or, yeah. So if you guys are going a little cross-eyed right now with this. Going fast, that's what I say. <laughs> There's, there's two things you can do. You can go south for the winter, or um, most dealers offer winterization. Uh, we, we offer a basic winterization doing exactly the way he's describing for 90 bucks. And then we added 20 bucks to do the ice maker. No, is that? Yeah, yeah 20 bucks on the ice maker. And, and the uh, inline water filter, that's 20 bucks and if you had a washer dryer we charge 50 bucks for that so if you can get an appointment with us and I'm sorry it's pretty tough right now we, we do that a lot of people do you know offer winterizing and it, it is an option if you want to do it yourself I'm available Friday Saturday Sunday and Monday he's available sometimes during the week there's a few people in the company that are available on the phone to help you through your questions. We, is, there's a lot here, but uh, if you get in cross-eyed, we don't blame you. This is, this is a complicated one. It's really so anyway. easy to get to that, right? I'm uh, sorry? I say it's really easy to get to that. Back to the ice maker valve? Yeah. Base. It's the, right. one of the most obvious the parts. Pull the RV, uh, refrigerator inspection panel off, it's right there. It's gonna be blue. If you have a door one, there's going to be two of them sitting next to each other. Door ice water. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard anything about RV actually. You guys advocate it? Oh yeah, that's our next step. After we get, after we get done, 
And that's why I'm bringing, that's why I went to get this little dude. Because for some of you, this may be the answer. Arctic man. It's great stuff. It makes great ice cubes. It freezes. Yeah. You're not supposed to. They're actually, the Trumas actually are designed, they have a, a drain that pulls out, flips open. Uh, are we blowing through those? I think the Trumas are designed not to. No, they do not Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Truma, great water heater. If any of you want true, true on-demand water, hot water, yeah, I'm assuming you have one. You love it? I'll tell you what, there's a couple other manufacturers out there that have what they call on-demand water heaters. They're, they're not. It's Truma, but it, like anything great, you pay for it. But the first time uh, my wife went in there and took her standard 20-minute shower at the campground, and she came out and she was like, I couldn't run the hot water out. I was her hero. <laughs> And sometimes that's all we can ask for. Can I step one, one more time? Sure. No, you step right in. Um, I'm getting tired of talking. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Dave mentioned a minute ago that you can make ice cubes with this. And that's true. Uh, the difference between this and water is water has a coefficient, coefficient of expansion of about 10%. This has a 0, 0.0 coefficient of expansion, which means that when you freeze this, it doesn't swell up. So if you go around and, and you pump antifreeze through your lines and put in your P-traps and, and you do the East Coast winterize, that's what you call it, right? Yeah, East that's Coast. what I'm going to go over. Yeah. You'll have inner antifreeze in the lines. And it'll taint the water a little bit, but it will freeze solid. So it's not like it's in there liquid. It'll, it'll freeze just as well as the, at about the same temperature as water does but it will not expand. So that's why we use this. It is non-toxic. Of course, it tastes like but Yeah, if you just take a shot glass of that, it don't taste Yeah, but you got to put some in it. An olive. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. okay, so say, saying that, the reason we put, yes. I'm sorry, I'm going to come back there. Basically, you would do it just like if you're, if, if it's already frozen, it's frozen. It hasn't expanded, nothing's broke. But at some point, you're going to have to turn your furnace on and get everything warmed up to turn it back into a liquid so that you can drain it out. Now, if you do what I call an East Coast winterize, that's where you don't have an air compressor. You don't want to go through the, this whole thing. It's another option. A lot of the towables and fifth wheels now have what they call a country fill or uh, an RV antifreeze port. So what they do is, let's go back one. I'd rather use some more paper up, but let's do this. Right here between the fresh tank and the pump, they put this port in. It's a brass port with a little short hose. Usually you can always get to that somehow. Usually your water pump's fairly accessible. So what you can do is, you always drain the water out of the water heater no matter how you winterize it. Because if you try to do an East Coast winterize, you're gonna need six gallons of that just to fill this. An East Coast winterize is basically leaving everything in it the way it is. What you're going to do is trade it out for antifreeze, every square inch of it. So you're going to turn off your water heater and drain it. Then you're going to get this port. I'm going to open this. Parts people love when I do this. 
I think you outrank them. I think it's okay. It's a brass valve. Basically just like the one on the, the plastic ones on the back. It makes the water go either this way or this way. So when you get this all together, and this is sitting underneath the couch or in the closet, you can turn on your pump, stick it down in this jug, turn your pump on. It now draws from the pump, not the tank. You still have to drain your tank, but you leave your low points closed because what you want to do is you want to fill all this up with antifreeze. It's going to take you, depending on the size of your unit, two or three gallons. What is this now? Six, seven dollars a gallon? Six, five, six, okay. Seven ninety nine, eight dollars, sixteen dollars may be cheaper than trying to get the air hose out from the shop and do all that. So in turn, you turn the pump on. This goes down in, replaces all the water in the system with antifreeze. You're done. It will. The cheap, even cheap vodka is probably more than eight bucks a gallon. Um, so yes, yeah, true. So, now the only secret is when you go to use this, a lot, a lot of people do this when they like to winter camp. They don't have a place to keep it from freezing, so they have to winterize it two or three times a year. It's quick and easy. Costs a little more. I blow mine out. I have a bigger unit. It's got, I've just done it for years, every place I've worked, so it's easy for me. I can do a winterize on my fifth wheel in about 10 minutes. However, this is the easiest way so you don't have to try to remember all this. What you do have to remember is once you turn that pump on, you got to go around, turn the kitchen faucet on, hot and cold. Usually I'll do just cold until you see pink coming out. Turn it off. Turn the hot on. Turn it on until you see pink coming out. Go to the shower. Turn the cold on until so you, till, till you see pink coming out. As soon as you see the pink coming out, then you've the water, it has forced the water through and the antifreeze has replaced it. Go to the outside shower, don't forget it. As soon as you see pink coming through, you're good. When we do Highline Motorhomes, we use that Widowmaker, uh, Suicide Core, whatever you want to call it. We actually energize the magnetic water valve until we see water coming out the door of the refrigerator. Nothing will freeze. What happens, though, is when you go to use it, you have to hook the city water hose up and then run everything until you get all this pink stuff out. It's not, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I drank this whole thing, it would hurt me. It is potable. It's, it's, uh, it's not like putting car antifreeze in your pipes. If you do that, it's going to be very expensive because we will have to pull it all out. And when I mean pull it all out, I mean all your plumbing has to be replaced. So you will get a little smell the day after you use this. Uh, it smells pretty good right now. It's, uh, usually it has a little bit of a peppermint smell. Make sure. Yeah. But it's not going to hurt you. But if you run the faucet till it stops foaming and pink stuff comes out, you're good. Yeah. Yes, it will. His question is, uh, your happy camper, we, said we have happy camper tank cleaner we use for cleaning probes. You should have some in there for uh, keeping your probes clean. Um, but that's your first usage. If, it's, if you have happy camper in there and it's set that long, it's already done its job. It's already lived its life. So whatever goes in here, your first trip camping, you'll dump it out when you dump your sewer. So it should be fine. Well, I wouldn't recharge my holding tanks until I did all my, until after I cleaned it out. Yeah. Does everybody know what charging your fresh black tank means? He brought it up, so now I'm going to explain it. Thanks. I, I gave him five bucks earlier and said, bring this up. Charging your black tank. Before you go camp, every time you dump your black tank, you should be charging it. 
we call a pre-lubricating. So your black tank's a flat ABS uh, piece of plastic, basically a big tank. You need to take some happy camper or chemical of your choosing. We like happy camper. We know it works. So that's what we use. Mix it up in a five gallon bucket, dump it down your tank to add a little liquid to the bottom of your black tank. It's called pre-lubricating or uh, that's what we call it. Basically that gives your solids somewhere to hit and splash rather than to sit on the bottom and start growing. Plus the Happy Camper is uh, an active enzyme that will start to eat away at your paper and your waste. Because there's a lot of bad things that go in there. So Now Hydra Hot, if you have, we talked about Hydra Hot, Aqua Hots earlier. Hydronic heating looks just like the guys in the shop always kid they're going to take one and make a whiskey steal out of it. Because when you tear it apart, it's basically... It's basically a burner tube that looks like that with a big hole in the end with a flame that shoots into it. And it's got these big copper things that go around it. And your cold water comes in, hot water comes out. It's really hard to get all that water out of there. The, the price of these, you don't even want to know. Believe me, we've had to replace a couple, two or three this year. The best way to do a unit with hydronic heating is to do a complete, that we do ours here, do a complete. It is going to take you three, four, five gallons to do. But 30 or 40 bucks, if you're only going to do it once a year, is pretty, pretty uh, cost effective. I think the last one we did with one of these with the install was $13,000. Yes, your insurance usually will cover it, but they, at $13,000, you'll usually, uh, I don't care what the commercial says, we'll never raise your insurance rates. No, it will. So, okay, more questions. There's got to be more because we're running really quick on this class. Yeah, you're next. So, your water pump, did you run that with your blowing? Glad you brought it up. Glad you brought it up. I forgot that. Even, even, for, us, even for us that have done this forever, when we're doing it, we've done it so long we know. But when you're trying to explain it, you forget little steps. As you're running the air through the system, you should run your water pump. Which one was it? I need to hire me a paper turner. Next time, you're it. So when you're running your air, that's going to force a little water back through your pump. People say, oh, it'll burn your pump up. I've seen dry water pumps run for days. They get a little warm. but it doesn't really burn them up. And you're not doing it forever, you're just doing it for five, 10 minutes. Okay, you were next. Well, I never winterize because I'm in sort of a shed, but it's, I just run the furnace if it's gonna be freezing the weather until you want it to turn on. But probably should still uh, drain that hot water heater once a year anyway. Yeah, he, he doesn't winterize because he keeps it in the shed. If that's worked for you, then your shed, you know, co cold's cold, but usually wind is what gets you. If you park your unit next to the house and you notice every day that you get that wind, that north and south or whatever wind going past that trailer, it can get cold, but when that wind starts hitting it, that wind gets into everything and it'll freeze them up. If you're in a shed, you're a little better and a lot of people don't have problems with them in a shed. But the most expensive piece in there is going to be your water heater. Probably just to definitely drain it. Yeah, if you have a furnace on, that's what I did. Uh, fortunately, this year we haven't had that much cold yet, and we're going camping this weekend. Uh, I've lived in mine for about the last year and a half, so we made it through the winter. But usually, I'll, usually depending on the, the winter, 
this winter, after we go camping this time, will be my last time this year. We bought a new house, so I got a lot of stuff to do. So I will give it a full winter rise. Well, I've camped out uh, during the winter at Diamond Lake. You know, yeah. Uh, if you're camping in it and the furnace is going. And the furnace is going, it doesn't, it's never closed. Right. Most new units, if you're camping in it during the winter, they won't freeze. Some of the older units didn't have bellies in them, and the, the plumbing was all exposed. It can, they can still freeze even if you're uh, camping in them. Most of the new units, they're selling what they call it's a four-season unit. Uh, some of those units, all that requires that being a four-season unit is they dump one of the ports off your furnace down into the belly. Sure, they give you dual pane windows, they give you a little ex insulation in here, but the most important thing when you're camping in Montana and it's 20 below zero, uh, uh, you know, it, it's your insulation f for the plumbing. And that's what a lot of them do. They just dump a two inch or a four inch down there, which keeps it plenty warm, keeps everything thawed out. And a duct, two inch or four inch duct. Usually it's usually it's a four inch and they split it to, and they send a two inch to each end or but just any heat down there to get that heated up. But my my first nomad, first winter I had it, we went out camping and froze everything. Old copper lines and uh, didn't have any belly in it. So everything was right out there in the open. Yeah. So you mentioned after blowing out you never mentioned if you put in traps. In the traps. Yes, that's what we do. That's the only place we put it is in the traps. Really don't need no, we don't put it in the toilet because this can actually stain. If you do put this in your P traps and you're not good enough to get it right down the little hole, take a rag and wipe the extra out because it can stain certain plastics. What about your dump valves and your uh, black tank and stuff? Should you dump a little in there and make sure that any residual water in that tank doesn't freeze? You, usually that tank's big enough. If you have a little in there and it's going to freeze, it'll climb up before it before it uh, does that. However, next spring, what you should do is get some black valve or gray valve lubricant. Since you mentioned it, I'll mention it. Everybody talks about keeping their tanks clean. They actually sell a lubricant you can put in your uh, tanks when you're dumping it. And it's coconut oil. I don't know what it is. Some magic that when you dump your tank, it clings to your rubber seals and lubricates them. Makes them slide easier, keeps them healthy. 99% of the time we change black and gray valves out. It's because there's toilet paper or something else stuck in there. But the customer believes it's always, especially under the first year warranty, it's always they did something wrong. And usually it's not. And when Dan has to tell you, well, we found that four-ply Charmin Extra Soft wound up in your black valve, that'll be $260. Dan's not your friend anymore. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I use the uh, air pressure system to winterize. Do you? Well, like I say, times have changed, but I have to do these pretending that some of you might have a 1984 Nomad or Aljo or uh, what were we running back in the day? 60, 60, 65 pounds, but right. Believe it or not, the, the copper pipes were uh, would rupture quicker than the new poly pipes. As long as you have everything open, we, we run 130 PSI through them. Yeah, and I'd go more than 40. We're using a huge compressor. We're using a constant a turbine compressor. Looks like a blower on a, it's a constant velocity compressor. It doesn't even have a tank. This thing is a big bad boy. Like an eight so yeah, well, it's only as big as that chair, but it spins so fast it'll. But the secret is here: you have to make sure everything's open. 
if you're putting 130 psi open and the only thing you have is your outside shower on it's going to be ugly so yeah um, I just wanted to comment on him running it down at 40 45 psi the problem is with it low pressures not moving water and we the, the air just pulls over so we if if you are doing it blowing it out and you have a compressor you need to run it at least 65 to 80 psi just to get the water out and help dry dries so i've seen people trying to do it with those little 12 volt plug in tire you know you have in the toolbox that's not enough somebody had a hand up yeah so in the summer when we go to put it all back together how often do you replace the washers in the cap do you do it annually or just every couple the washers where only if they leak my my unit's 10 years old and I still got the same ones in them they're a cone washer this has a little glycerin base the glycerin is very good for those o-rings and seals so if there's a little of this in there it'll it'll you don't have to worry about it these caps did that have caps in it no they're just caps for your low point drains most of them just have a cone washer in there then your cap comes out and around and your threads are in here that cone washer they sell tons of them but if it's not leaking uh, matter of fact most of the time if you if you go to change them out you'll they'll start to leak because what happens is that cone washer gets to know the bottom of that fitting and it's just perfect and they'll get to where you don't even have to get a plier on there and tighten them run them up finger tight and give them up <clears throat> they'll never leak yeah if you, it, it all depends on the weather where you live here grants pass it gets cold there too you have to watch the weather now but don't watch the weather and say okay it's gonna get <coughs> another thing with freezing let's say you're watching the weather and it's gonna get down to 31 next Wednesday but the daytime temperature Tuesday was 68 and the next day the afternoon temperature is gonna be 65 that 31 degrees that night for that short time is not gonna affect anything because the bones of that unit has seen that 68 degree temperature all day even though you may walk in there and it's still chilly and you need a coat the aluminum wall the paneling the countertops everything's 68 degrees when it hits 31 outside it's probably only going to be 40 36 inside and by the time it ever would get to reaching the sun's back up and starting this procedure again it's when we get those two three four days where it's going to be 45 today, 28 tonight, 37 tomorrow, 30, because it can't warm up enough to offset that freeze temperature. That's when we start worrying. Some winters around here, we have a winter where nothing would ever froze. We get a couple freezes. And then we get that winter where we've been seeming to have quite a few of them here recently, where we have a week or two where we very seldom get out of freezing. So that's when it does it. A lot of people get their house pipe under their house pros. You know, they got the furnace going and everything. Yep. My new house, I got to watch for it. It's different. It has explodes. It's, it's a manufactured home. So this guy back here has been. Macerator toilet. Macerator, well, the, the whole macerator toilet? best way to winterize a macerator is to blow air and you're going to have to keep manually flushing it macerator toilet uh, which they're not doing a lot of anymore um, they, they, are, they do have macerator pumps on a lot of the bees but on a macerator toilet you just got to keep pumping it keep hitting manual flush until you get the water out or you can do a full full flush there are certain things that 
just tell us, hey, if you come in and we say, oh, you got macerators and uh, two valves in your refrigerator and a hydronic, we're not even going to offer the air hose. We're going to say, hey, this is what you really need. And if we're going to do it and, say, and stand behind our winterize, we'll tell you that's what you need. And if you say, no, I just want you to hit it with air, we'll do that. But then you're going to sign this big disclaimer that says at no point are we really responsible for any of this. So we don't like to do, you know, we, we would rather do it the right way. And hopefully we've done this long enough that if we say, yes, it's going to cost you an extra 60 bucks, but this is the right way to do it, you're going to say, Dan, you look trustworthy. We're going to do it. Did that answer your question? Cool. So we're talking about winterizing. Is there, is there anything, as far as the roof is concerned, the, the seals and the, the stuff that they put on to seal your, all your vents, is there anything you do, you should do to protect that in the wintertime? Or is, what are the biggest factors? You should have, he's talking about roof seals, winterizing, and stuff for your roof seals. That stuff you should have been doing every third, every 60 to 90 days, the whole life of your coach, checking those. As long as your roof seals look good and you've touched up or had it sealed, it should winter just as well as it does summer. Matter of fact, they'll usually winter better than they will summer. The, the reason you notice leaks in the winter isn't because all of a sudden miraculously it rained on it and your seal went bad. It's because all summer it sat up there and cooked and did this and stretched and expanded and contracted and you got a leak during the summer, but you noticed it when the rain came. So the first thing you do is say, that darn rain, the sun's really hard on roofs. So just keep a constant eye on them. Anything that looks like needs to be sealed or touched up, please feel free to do it. We can give you the stuff or call us and we'll give it a, a free roof inspection. I know we talked about that. We do free roof inspections. We do prefer you call, let us know you're coming. Don't just all show up to m Monday morning because you'll see me go into a little bit of a panic. So, but if you call, we'll climb up there, take pictures and say, hey, you look great. We'll see you in about three months. Or we'll say, you've got 45 minutes worth of sealant that needs to be done. So by the time the 45 minutes is up and you spend the 20 bucks in sealant, 70 bucks, we can fix it quick for you. Or we're gonna say, holy smokes. And that's when you go, uh-oh. Cracks, yeah. You should have been to our last one. So next next October, September, September. next September, come to our seals and roof seals and but yeah, just look for crack or stop and talk to him. Somebody back here, yeah. No. Well, the heat blankets are fine for your fresh tank and stuff, but the problem is they don't heat up the interior. So if you're staying in it, you shouldn't need a heat blanket. What kind of a unit do you have? It's got a belly and it should be fine. As long as you're running the furnace to keep you comfortable, which I'm going to say in that is somewhere between 65 and 70. Uh, all thermostats have about a three degree, three to four degree variance, plus or minus. That's why you'll notice you get in your trailer and it says it's 70 and you're sweating. It's because it's actually 73 or 74. That's where you find that sweet spot. You'll notice that 66 feels good. Oh, they are open underneath on that? Yeah. Then you can. You're going to have to get pretty cold before it's going to, you know, that floor is going to stay warm. You're still going to have ducting under there somewhere for your furnace, unless it's a straight out the front furnace. But you're still, your floor is going to get warm. Uh, you're going to have to get pretty cold. If you're going to Montana or somewhere, or Alaska, yeah, we may want to, or better yet, is there, salesmen love to hear me say this, you should just go get one with 
winterized package. No, the one you bought is perfectly okay. Just like you, you got to kind of think where you're heading, what it's going to be. Uh, I don't have a problem with the winterized, the heat pads on the tanks. Sometimes if they don't have a belly underneath those even, the wind whips at them and ends up tearing them off. Uh, you know, they're a great thing, but and you're going to have to get 110 volt or 12 volt ones. You can't, you can't use them if you're dry camping. You have to be plugged in at a park. Because basically it would be like plugging in, uh, you'd have to have an inverter if you went 110. And if at 12 volt, it would be like plugging in uh, your coffee pot on your batteries. It would last half hour and they'd be dead. So heat blankets are great. Heating pads if you're going to be not dry camping. So, before he gets back into another 20-minute roll, I want to talk about, uh, I, I talk about the sideline issues. He talks about the big tickets. So, um, when you're doing your winterize, one of the things that a lot of folks come across is under the kitchen sink or in your plumbing bay, you'll have a, a water filter. Two things. Number one, every fall when you winterize, you do not reuse that filter. The bacteria and things can grow in the filter, and so regardless of whether you used it once or used it all season, at the end, at this fall when you winterize, throw out that filter, but not until after you've matched it up with the right new one. Yes. Can you, uh, after you blow oil, say you blow all your lines out, can you leave that filter off for the winter? Well, that's the plan. You take it off, you throw it away. Most of the filters come with, and if you bought a, a new coach, they come with a bypass. Um, either either a, a piece of plumbing or the little fitting that goes up in the diverter valve for, where the water filter fits in. Uh, they come with a bypass means so that they can run the system without the filter in it, then we just either blow it out or pump the antifreeze through. There are external water filters, and <laughs> it's amazing how many we sell in the spring. We have them over here. They're a canister filter, and the people when they're good intentions in that and they're getting ready to uh, winterize, they open it up, take the filter out, close it up again, and the thing collects all the water while they're winterizing. And then we sell just the part that breaks. And we sell a couple hundred of them every year. Yeah, so when you're doing your winterize, you want to take off, remove the filter, and do not reinstall the canister. And they do make bypasses for them so that it's basically completely out of the system. Or you can put the canister on to winterize and then take it off. Thanks for bringing that up. I did forget filters. Huh? Out of it. Take the filter out. Take the filter out, dump the water out, put it on, winterize it, and then just take the fil take the housing off and leave it lay in your compartment. Or filters themselves because the bacteria will turn on you. Yes. So I don't know if I have one or not. Do I look under the sink? Is that the most likely? Kitchen sink is usually where they are. There's two types of filters. Incoming water. Yeah, there's two kinds of filters. You have a whole coach filter, which they usually don't filter that much. They just get the big chunks out. And then usually in the kitchen for cooking, they'll have one on the cold water. And it should be, uh, and on, in some of the smaller coaches, you really have to hunt for them, but they're somewhere under the kitchen sink, and they're just in line with the cold to that faucet. But you need to do what you need to do and get that filter out of there. And if you're in a hard water area, you probably are going through filters every 
three or four months, but at least once a year filter so that you don't die from the bacteria that's growing in there. That's all I had on that. Uh, you want to get back into where you were at? Or? At this point, it's just answering questions. Anything I may have missed on winterizing, uh, anything else that you may want to know about that we didn't cover. Uh, we did go over a couple little things from previous seminars, but it's early enough we, we can answer questions. Yeah. Well, what kind of a unit do you have? Just a travel trailer. Uh, depending on how many miles you do it, you should do it every couple of years. If you go a lot, I suggest it's cheap enough to do it every year. It's a hundred, huh? If you go twice a month, yeah, 10,000 miles. You got to speak up. Daryl didn't turn. He t didn't turn you on and went to the restroom. It's wiggling back and forth, and the bearings are. So you need to do, company policy is, we'd like to have you do it once a year, but a minimum of every other year, have your bearings greased. And when we do that, we obviously have to replace the seal. We do a brake inspection and adjustment every other year at least. One of the, uh, oh, go ahead. How about the uh, award? Uh, uh, winterized award. Winterized washing yeah, machine? Yeah. You got to run a cycle. If you have a washing machine, you're, it's a good, washing machines are messy to winterize because you're going to have a filter down at the bottom and when you pull that filter out, uh, about a quart of water comes out the front. So same thing, and if, while you're blowing up with air, you have to actually turn it on and run a cycle so that it cycles all the water through the pump. Do you dump uh, the antifreeze down? Yeah. Uh, so, sometimes when you're done, you can put a little, open the door and put a little in. That's just going to go in the bottom of the tank. It's not going to, it's not going to keep. You run through that last, uh, Yep, you run the whole thing, but you, I'm not going to stand there for two hours and wait for, to hit the magic moment to get that in there. If you don't have any water going to it, that spin cycle should throw all the water out. Wound down here, and he and I have our pet issue, and so I'm going to take a minute to talk about a couple of mine. A lady brought up a very good point. Uh, she wanted to know if they could run their uh, furnace while they're going down the road. And it is a federal and state law that you cannot operate a towed vehicle, pickup camper, a trailer, a fifth wheel. You cannot operate it, tow it down the road with the propane on. It is illegal. If you have a motorized, you, it's a frame mounted tank, not cylinders but a frame mounted tank it is okay to do that unless you're going into gas station or ferries then you have to shut it down because in a motorized it's frame mounted it's more secure they think but the compartment needs to be warm so they you can do that so um we're, he was talking about packing his tires, and his, his tires. Uh, if you're leaving a coach sitting for a long period of time, uh, the problem is the coach, the tire sits and the cords start to separate and they flatten out. And if it's more than a year and a half to two years where it has sat with a full load on it, those tires are, are shot. In our industry, in the trucking industry, uh, they say eight years is the life expectancy of a tire. And if it has sat for two years, we look at it the same way. And we we see every spring people get their rig out, and if they check their tires, great. They go to Yellowstone in, in June, 
and they get 100 miles and blow a tire, another 50 miles blow a tire. 200 miles down the road, they've replaced all four tires because they have sat for years. So it's a good thing to, uh, if, if you can lift up your coach, if you have jacks on your motorhome, manually extend them all the way, get that thing, if it's level, get it up to take as much load off that suspension and tires as possible. The manufacturers recommend that, it's a good thing. If you have a trailer or a fifth wheel like he does, suspend that thing a little bit, get some of that load off those tires, and then uh, be cognizant of those tires. If they start thumping a little bit, it's time to get rid of them. I, I don't have anything else. I don't either. I just... RV club that go out once a month and solves all our problems. That's right. Join an RV club. You guys will go enough. You won't have flat spots. Yeah. Any more questions about anything? This is kind of a quick one. If you do have questions later or you forget something, call and ask for David Taylor in service because we do have two David Taylors here. And the David Taylor in finance is not going to help you winterize. <laughs> He'll probably talk you into buying an extended service contract or something. But if you have questions, call me. Every question that comes through uh, guarantee RV service comes through my desk. So I answer 99% of them. So if you have questions later, call and ask. I will have to call you back because they won't put you right through to my cell phone. Uh, a lot of meetings and stuff. So I will call you back. Yeah. Or ask for Dan. He can help you too. Or just walk in the door and ask. We're here. Okay. Everybody have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you.